As we begin our study of the 12th chapter of Romans, its author, the Apostle Paul, introduces the concept of sacrifice, presenting our bodies as living sacrifices pleasing and acceptable to God, the concept of dying to self. Welcome to the Bible Study Hour, a radio and internet broadcast with Dr. James Boyce, preparing you to think and act biblically. Self-sacrifice and dying to self have never been popular subjects, yet, as the Apostle Paul points out, it's at those very points that we paradoxically begin to live as Christians. Join Dr. Boyce as he explains the foundational teaching that we have been bought with a price and are not our own and the benefits of a sacrificed life. There are certain words that I don't like to use in connection with Christianity, and one of them is the word paradox, and there's a very good reason for that. In most people's minds, paradox refers to statements that are mutually contradictory and therefore false. Christianity is not false. Christianity is true. And so I don't like to use a word that brings misunderstanding. But if you look at the dictionary carefully and look at the various definitions that are given for the word paradox, you'll find that one of them is this, a statement that seems to be contradictory and yet may be true in fact. And if you think of that definition, well, there are certainly paradoxes in Christianity. The Trinity is an example. We speak of one God, and yet we say that one God exists in three persons. We Pray to God the Father, but it's also right to pray to God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. None of us pretend that we can understand how to put that together, although there are ways of referring to it theologically. The church spent a lot of time working that out in the early centuries of church history, but anybody who pretends that they understand that fully or can explain it is very foolish. Trinity, like many things about God, is beyond us. Now, there is a great paradox or seeming paradox in the Christian life. And the paradox is this, that we must die in order to live. You find that a lot of places in the Bible. I can think perhaps of half a dozen places offhand. It's implied in other passages, but the foundational teaching is certainly from Jesus Christ. Think what Jesus Christ said about being his disciple, that classic passage in Luke 9. He said, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Now, to take up your cross was to proceed willingly in the direction of your execution. So it's very clear what he's talking about. But then, in case you miss that, he spells it out in the next sentence. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will save it. Now, that's the foundational teaching. I suppose that it was those words, more than anything else, that inspired that well-known prayer of St. Francis Assisi, O Divine Master. Let me show you how it goes. If you've forgotten it, it goes like this. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love, for it is by giving that we receive, it is by pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is by dying that we are born to eternal life. I wouldn't want to vouch for the implications theologically of every one of those sentences, but as a statement of the principles that govern the Christian life, it isn't bad. It's by dying to self that we really find a life which is fulfilling and worthwhile. Now, that is exactly what Paul is introducing in the 12th chapter of Romans. He uses this matter of sacrifice. He speaks of our presenting our bodies as living sacrifices, and what he's really talking about is dying to self in order that we might live to God. Here's what he says, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, which is your spiritual worship. Now you see, in the cultural climate of that day, a sacrifice was always offered to a priest, and the priest killed it. Well, when Paul says, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, he's really saying you need to die to self in order to belong to God, but he is saying paradoxically that when you do that, you're going to live. That's what that striking image is all about. It's by dying that we live, period. And 
The corresponding paradox works on the other side as well as this. If you're trying to live, that is in the sense of you're living for yourself, if you think that everything that is here is here for you to enjoy and to get as much satisfaction as you can out of life, well, then that's the sure path to death. And the world in which we live is proving that all the time. Now, this is a great foundational teaching. This is the first principle that he's developing that's going to be unfolded now as he goes through these latter chapter of Romans about the Christian life. And since this is such foundational teaching, this is the basic principle of living the Christian life, what we need to do is examine the foundations for the foundation. Why is it that this matter of self-sacrifice is presented first by Paul here in the very first verse of this application section of the letter? Well, the first foundation is this. We are not our own, but we belong to Jesus Christ if we're truly Christians. We're not our own. We belong to him. We must die to self in order to serve him. Now, let me give you some passages in which that's said clearly. Paul, when he wrote to the Corinthians, developed it. In the sixth chapter, verses 19 and 20, he wrote this, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have received from God. You are not your own. You are bought with a price. And then one chapter later, in the seventh chapter, the 23rd verse, he said it again. You were bought with a price. Do not become the slaves of men. That is, the slave of the culture in which you live. And if at that point, recognizing that he's talking about a price, we say, well, what is that price with which we're bought? Well, the apostle Peter answered that very clearly in his first letter. And you probably know those verses as well. First Peter 1, 18 and 19, you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver and gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Now, the word Peter uses there to describe what Jesus has done for us is the word redemption. We have been redeemed by the price of Jesus' blood. Redemption is a commercial term. It means to buy again because it has the prefix re with it. It means to buy again or to buy out of the marketplace. So the object that's bought never has to return to the marketplace again. Now that doesn't make a great deal of sense to us if all we're thinking about are objects. But when you remember that in the ancient world, a great deal of the commerce was commerce in slaves, it begins to make sense. Because the picture involved in that word redemption is a picture of slavery. You and I are the slaves. We're the slaves to sin in our natural state and slaves to the world that bids for us with all of its currency. And I suppose it's not far afield to say, using our own terminology, that people sell their souls for what the world has to offer. The world offers fame. People today will do anything to be famous. Compromise, sin, cheat even murder sometimes, to be famous. The world will bid wealth. Millions of people think that money is the most important thing in life, and as long as you have that, you'll be all right. Money will buy anything. The world bids power. Masses of people today are on a power trip. The world bids pleasure. Many have lost nearly everything of value in life for just that indulgence. Now, Into the midst of this vast vanity fair of the marketplace of sin comes the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ bids by paying the price of his blood for sinners such as you and me. And God, who is in charge of this auction, just as he's in charge of everything else, when he hears that bid, says, sold to the Lord Jesus Christ for the price of his blood. And so you become his. That's what Peter's talking about. We were redeemed not by silver and gold, not by wealth, not by all the things the world offers, but by the blood of Jesus Christ. And because there's no bid that's higher than that, nothing is more precious than the life of God, God the Father says, sold for the price of Jesus' blood. And we become his, you see. We belong to him. That's where the Christian life begins. It begins with that recognition, and everything flows from it. That great Bible teacher and preacher, John Calvin, wrote in very succinct and proper language, we are redeemed by the Lord for the purpose of consecrating ourselves and all our members to him. And that's exactly what Paul is saying here in Romans. Now, before I go on, let's point out one important thing about this. Here we are in the application section of the letter, and we're talking about redemption, but redemption was developed in the doctrinal section of the letter. As a matter of fact, way back in the third chapter, 
But what we have is an illustration of the very thing I was saying last week. I was saying you can't have the application without the doctrine. You can't have the ethics without the gospel. Here we're talking about self-sacrifice as the basis for the Christian life, but the very first thing we have to say about it is that we do that because we have been redeemed. But we can't have Christian living without the gospel. Now, redemption from sin by Jesus Christ is not the only foundation doctrine that underlies this matter of self-sacrifice. And the second one is this. We have died to the past by becoming new creatures in Jesus Christ. Now, Paul taught that very clearly in Romans 6. Some of you remember back to those days when we were studying Romans 6, and you remember that what Paul said there was this. We have died to sin, and because we have died to sin, we are unable to live in it any longer. That's the second verse of that chapter. Therefore, instead of offering the parts of our bodies to sin as instruments of wickedness, that's the language that he uses, as we used to do, we must now instead offer ourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and the parts of our bodies to him as instruments of righteousness. When we were studying that earlier, this matter of having died to sin, I pointed out a lot of things it doesn't mean, because we have misconceptions when we hear that phrase. It does not mean that we have become unresponsive to sin, Christians are still tempted by it, or that we should die to it, though of course that is true, or that we are dying to it day by day, though that is true as well, or that we have died to sin's guilt. Phrase doesn't mean any of those things. The verb die is in an aorist tense in the Greek, and it refers to something that has happened in the past and has abiding consequences. It doesn't say we ought to die to sin, or we will die to sin, or we should die to sin. It says we have died to sin. And when you say, well, what in the world does that mean? In what sense have we died to sin? The only answer to that is that we have died to sin in the sense that we have died to our past sinful life. We can't go back to being what we were. And if we can't go back to being what we were, well, then the only thing we can do is go forward. And the way you go forward is by presenting yourself to Jesus Christ as a living sacrifice. And let me review that again. Dying to sin does not mean that it is my duty to die to sin. It does not mean that I am commanded to die to sin. It does not mean that I am to consider sin as a dead force within me. It does not mean that I am dead to sin as long as I am gaining the mastery over it. It does not mean that sin in me has been eradicated. It does not mean that counting myself dead to sin makes me insensitive to it. What Paul was teaching is that we already have died to sin in the sense that we cannot successfully return to our old lives. And therefore, since that's true, we might as well get on with the task of living the Christian life. In other words, we need to forget about sinning and instead present our bodies as living sacrifices to God. So that's the second foundational doctrine. Now the third is the paradox itself, namely that it is by dying to our own desires in order to serve Christ that we actually learn to live. I don't think it's hard to understand that. When we talk about dying to our own desires, we know what that means. It means putting ourselves behind in order that, number one, we might serve God and fulfill his desires for us, and number two, we might serve other people. It's exactly the picture of Jesus Christ, who didn't consider his own desires, but became a sacrifice for us, dying on the cross, and who in that great demonstration in the upper room actually unclothed himself, girded himself with a towel, and washed the disciples' feet. That's what we're talking about. I don't think we have any trouble understanding that. And what is more, I don't think we have any trouble understanding the promise. Very clear what the Bible is saying. The Bible is saying is if you will live that way, well, then you'll be fulfilled. You'll be happy. The problem is not understanding. The problem is believing it. We don't really believe it. Or maybe, you know, because as Christians, we don't want to utterly say we disbelieve the Word of God. We might believe it kind of in a general way as applying to somebody else, but we certainly do not believe it applies to ourselves in the difficult circumstance in which we live. We think if we did that, we would be miserable, and we don't want to be miserable, so we won't do it. I want you to think about that. What we're talking about here is our own way of looking at things versus the way God describes them to us. And the question is this. Who are we going to believe? Are we going to believe ourselves, reinforced by the world, of course, everything about us is reinforcing that secular way of judging life, or are we going to believe Jesus Christ? Now, I mention Jesus Christ particularly because of the way he spoke about these things in the Sermon on the Mount. You know, at the very beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, 
And what we call the Beatitudes, the Lord Jesus Christ explained how it is that a person can be happy. Some of our versions actually use that word, happy is the man who. Now, the word is actually stronger than that, so I prefer the word blessed. It means the favor of God will rest upon the people who live this way, but it at least involves happiness or fulfillment, and that's what Jesus is talking about. And here's what he says. Let me just remind you of his teaching. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, and they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek. They will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Now, we call these the Beatitudes. That is the way in which the blessing of God will rest upon you for your life. But it is not the way the world thinks. The world thinks in exactly opposite categories. If the director of one of our popular television sitcoms or the editor of one of our glossy and widely circulating fashion magazines were to sit down together and write a list of Beatitudes, it wouldn't go like that. It would go something like this. Blessed are the rich, for they can have all they want. Blessed are the powerful, for they can control others. Blessed are the sexually liberated, because they can fully satisfy themselves. Blessed are the famous, because they are envied, and so on. That's the way the world will do that. Isn't that true? Isn't that the way the world thinks? You don't need a degree in theology to figure that out. All you have to do is read a magazine. Those are the values of the world. But you see, you have to think it through carefully. Those are the world's values. That's what the world is promising. But the question is this, does the promise actually follow upon the lifestyle? Do people actually find fulfillment and happiness that way? You have to be perceptive at that point because the world is trying to disguise things. Everything you read, everything you see, all the pictures, all the glitter, all the movies, they're all disguising the reality of it, but you look below the surface and see if it really holds true. Let me present it this way. Think of a person who sets his mind on wealth. He thinks if he just has enough money, he'll be happy. So he sets out to earn $100,000, and he gets it. Not so easy to do that today, but some people do. And he gets it, but he's still not happy. He says, well, you know, what I need is a little bit more. You can lose $100,000 in a hurry today. Maybe if I had 200000 So he works on that. After he gets that, he wants a million, and so on. He's still not happy. In his day, John D. Rockefeller was one of the wealthiest men who ever lived, and uh, somebody asked him on one occasion, Mr. Rockefeller, how much money is enough? And Rockefeller answered wisely and wittily, just a little bit more. It was a Texas millionaire who said, I thought money could buy happiness. I have been miserably disillusioned. Well, here's another person who thinks that the way to be happy is through power. If you have power, you control other people, and the way power is held today, they think, is through the political process, so they set out to achieve political office. They run for a local office, and they win. Pretty soon they set their mind upon a congressional seat. They get that. If they have enough money, they go for the Senate, and perhaps if circumstances are right and everything develops properly, they have their eye on the highest office of all. They want to become President of the United States. But power doesn't give happiness. One of the world's greatest statesmen once told Billy Graham, I am an old man. Life has lost all meaning. I am ready to take a fateful leap into the unknown. I suppose today, what is most put forward is sexual liberation. Here's a woman who buys into that. She gets into the swinging single scene where life is a succession of Friday night parties and weekend getaways and a succession of partners, but it doesn't work for her. A number of years ago, CBS did a program in which they examined the swinging lifestyle out in California. They interviewed a number of women, about half a dozen of them, and they all said the same thing. It boiled down to this. We were told that this was the fun way to live, but all the men want to do is get in bed with you. We have had enough of that to last a lifetime. You say, this is the question. Does this me-first philosophy lead to happiness? Is personal indulgence the answer? The answer is no. You don't have to be a genius to see through that facade. Though, as I say, you have to look carefully because the world is doing everything it can to disguise it. 
This is a hollow promise. Even worse than that, in the first chapter of Romans, Paul calls it a lie, and yet many of people have bought the lie. What I say is wake up and listen to Paul when he says to you, you're a Christian now, he's writing to you, he says, therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, which is your spiritual worship. Don't conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, and then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, his pleasing and perfect will. God does not lie. The Word of God can be trusted, and if you go his way, you'll find that his will is good, pleasing, and perfect if you will bend to it. Now that brings me to the fourth and final point. You see, the first two points concern what God has done for us. He has redeemed us through the work of Jesus Christ. He's joined us to the Holy Spirit so that we become new creatures. We can't go back. That's what God has done. Then I stated the principle. That's the paradox. It's by dying that we live. Life by dying. That's the principle. Now we come to the fourth point, and the fourth point is not a statement of something that God has done for us, or even the principle. Rather, it's something that we must do. It's an appeal to us to do something, and what we are to do, Paul says it very clearly, is to offer our bodies to God as living sacrifices. Let me put it in other terms. Early in the letter, he spoke about the obedience that comes from faith. That's what he's talking about here. He said, through him and for his namesake, we receive grace and apostleship. He's talking about himself and the other apostles to call people from among all the Gentiles, that is from the world and the world's way of thinking, to the obedience that comes from faith. And you see what we've got here? We're back to the same principle I was talking about last week. The first chapters bear their fruit in the application in the second part, and it's because of the faith that we have the obedience, and the obedience comes from conforming to the will of God for us in the Lord Jesus Christ who has redeemed us. It's an interesting mental picture that Paul presents for us here. You know, a sacrifice, as I said earlier, is something offered to God by a priest. And what the priest would do is take that sacrifice that was brought to him by the worshiper, always a living animal, he would carry it to the altar, kill it, pour out the blood, and then burn the victim's body. Now, in that procedure, the priest... And the sacrifice are two separate entities. And what Paul does here in this arresting image is combine them, showing that the priest and the offering are the same. And what is more, he says, that is us. We are to be the priest, to make the offering, and the offering we are to make is of ourselves. You say to yourself at that point, that is such a striking novel idea. Certainly there must be a model for it somewhere. And as soon as you say, is there a model for it somewhere, the answer is obvious. Yes, that's what the Lord Jesus Christ did. Because he was at the same time our high priest, and he was at the same time the sacrifice because it was as our high priest that he offered himself for us. You know, we have that in one of our great communion hymns. The words of the first stanza go like this. They're translated from a 6th century Latin text by a Scotsman whose name was Robert Campbell. He wrote it in 1849. And here's what the first verse says. At the Lamb's high feast we sing praise to our victorious King who hath washed us in the tide flowing from his pierced side. Praise we him whose love divine gives his sacred blood for wine, gives his body for the feast, Christ the victim, Christ the priest. That's what Jesus Christ does. There's an enormous difference between the sacrifice of himself by Jesus Christ for us and our sacrifice of ourselves for him. His death was an atoning sacrifice. He was a substitution for us. He died for sin so that the wrath of God was poured out on Jesus Christ for him rather than being poured out upon us. We don't contribute in any way to our salvation. Our sacrifice is not a sacrifice of atonement in any way. And yet it is like the sacrifice of Jesus Christ in this respect, that we are the ones who make the sacrifice, and the sacrifices we make are ourselves. And there's this distinction, too. If you think back to the Old Testament, particularly to the book of Leviticus, where these ancient sacrifices and the forms for them are spelled out, you'll recall that there are two different kinds of sacrifices. There are sacrifices for sin, sin offerings. This is what Jesus Christ fulfilled And they were prophecies, they were types showing what it was that he was going to do. That's one kind, and we don't participate in that in any way. But then there were also what are called sacrifices of thanksgiving, and they're exactly what they sound like. A sacrifice that a worshiper would make, not as 
a sacrifice for sin. That offering had already been made, but simply because they were thankful for something that God had done. Now, it is that kind of sacrifice that we're called upon to make. See, God has done it all for us. He's saved us from our sin. He's redeemed us at the cost of His own blood. He has joined us to Himself by the Holy Spirit. So we can't go back to being what we were. We have a glorious destiny before us, but it is because of that, and because we're thankful that He's done it, that we offer ourselves up willingly as living sacrifices to God. And yet, I think today of our culture, and I think of that word sacrifice, and I say, what an utterly discordant word for our culture. People today don't want to be a sacrifice, and today, indeed, we don't want to sacrifice even a tiny little thing. We think just the opposite way. What we're trying to do is acquire things. We don't want to give things up, and yet this is the way the Christian life begins, all the same whether it's compatible with our culture or not. It is God's instruction and desire for us, and because it is, it is what Paul says it is. It is good, pleasing, and perfect, even if it doesn't seem to be that way to us. So, the question comes down to this. Will you trust God that he knows what he's doing? The world is telling us he doesn't know what he's doing. That's utter folly to live in a Christian way. But God says, you go the world's way, you will die. Indeed, you're dead already. You go his way, you'll live, and if you believe that, well, you'll do what Paul says to do. You'll present your body as a living sacrifice to God. And in our future studies, we're going to see in a little greater detail exactly what that means. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for these truths. We know they're true. You've given them to us. We don't have truth. We can't figure out truth. The world certainly is practicing lies. But here are these things. They're true. Our Failure is a failure of faith, which means we have a hard time believing them. But our Father, we ask you to help us believe them, and more than that, to live by them, in order that by your grace we might be all that you intend for us to be. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for listening to this message from the Bible Study Hour, a listener-supported ministry of the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals. The Alliance is a coalition of believers that hold to the historic creeds and confessions of the Reformed faith, and who proclaim biblical doctrine in order to foster a Reformed awakening in today's church. To learn more about the Alliance, select the appropriate link at thebiblestudyhour.org. Write to us at 600 Eden Road. Lancaster, Pennsylvania, 17601. Your financial support makes our broadcasting, publishing, online, and event ministries possible. Please consider making a gift at our websites by phone at 1-800-488-1888 or by mail. Canadian listeners can reach us at P.O. Box 24097, RPO Josephine, North Bay, Ontario, P1B0C7. Thank you for your prayers and gifts and for listening to the Bible Study Hour, preparing you to think and act biblically. Biblically.